Why is the digital economy fundamentally different than the industrial economy? And there's going to be a number of answers to this, but in this video, I'm going to go over probably the most important of those, which is that the digital economy moves us toward a public goods and club goods economy instead of a private goods economy. And I will explain this. But another way of putting this is that there were some features that were natural to the economy of things, like physical things, that are either absent or artificial in the digital economy. And in particular, scarcity and excludability. Like those things have changed when the digital economy comes first. And ultimately, I think the digital economy is what determines how energy resources flow, how physical resources flow. It's sort of like the digital economy is first and the physical economy is second. It follows. And because of that, there are a lot of people that are trying to figure out, given this fundamental shift, how can we navigate this with new tools? In fact, that's what Web 3.0 communities are essentially trying to do, is they're trying to say, given that the tool set of the economy has changed so dramatically. What can we do? How can we structure things differently that will be more democratic and more participatory and in ways that will help us get out from under the thumb of existing power structures? So what are the four types of goods and how have the ratios of these goods changed with the advent of the internet? Now we start with private goods. And private goods include things like ice cream and t-shirts and shoes. And the key two features of private goods are that they are rival and that they are excludable. Where excludable means if you own the shoes or the shirt or the ice cream cone, you can stop somebody else from consuming that. It's just yours. Like it's possible for you to say, no, I own this. I can... I can be a physical barrier between you and this ice cream cone. And then rival means if I consume the ice cream cone, that stops somebody else from being able to consume the same ice cream cone. Only one person can consume it without uh, the quality of that product diminishing. That's private goods. Now on the opposite side of this diagram, catty corner in the diagram shown, you have public goods. And public goods are the exact opposite. Classic example of public goods are firework shows and military protection, where both of these are non-rival and non-excludable. Non-excludable means you cannot exclude anyone from the protection they get with military. You can't say the military is protecting this neighborhood and not that neighborhood. If you have the military, they, they essentially protect everybody without excluding people, and you couldn't even exclude people if you wanted. And same with firework shows. If the firework show is going on, you can't exclude someone in the town from walking outside and watching it and enjoying it. So it is non-excludable. But these are both also non-rival. Non-rival means if one person's enjoying the firework show, that does not diminish anybody else's ability to fully enjoy the firework show just as much. Essentially, one person doesn't use up the public good. Common resources are rival but non-excludable. And examples of this include clean water, clean air, uh, timber, roads. You can't exclude somebody from enjoying the clean air. But it's rival in the sense that people can use it up. Like people can use up the clean air by smoking or polluting in some other way. And if you have a lake, it's possible that the setup of the lake is such that everybody can go use the lake, everybody can go fish. But it is possible to fish all of the fish out of the lake such that the population does not replenish the next year. So it's rival. Each person using the resource diminishes it for other people. And then the last good type here is club goods. And club goods are excludable but non-rival. And classic example here is the movie theater, where you can exclude people from entering the movie theater. But once they're there, one person enjoying the movie does not diminish another person's ability to enjoy the same movie. And if you compare the old economy to the new digital economy, the old economy had a lot of private goods and most of the thinking around economics in the old economy focused on private goods. Now the ratios obviously have switched with the digital economy. Digital products are essentially non-rival. 
That means if I put out this video, one person enjoying it does not diminish another person's ability to enjoy it. And whether it's excludable is going to depend on the technology that can artificially exclude people from using it. Like if you watch Netflix, Netflix is definitely a club good, but it's a club good because you enjoying movies there doesn't diminish other people's ability to enjoy movies there. But they can exclude you from watching the movies on Netflix through these digital technologies that require a password to log in. And YouTube videos are available for free, or either for free or else for a price of your, your attention time with the advertising, depending on how you look at it. But if YouTube as a platform has chosen to make those free, that does make that a public good, but only because they've chosen not to put it behind an artificial paywall. Now, there are definitely some major issues with common resources and perhaps especially oil in the current economy, but um, this video is about digital economies. Now, if you look at the Web 3.0 community, you do hear a lot of discussion about public goods and different ways of funding public goods, different ways of uh, communally determining which public goods we will choose to create. And you get a lot of experimental ideas in that space because they're just trying to come up with other ways of structuring economic activity with these new digital tools. So I would like to give a few examples of different structures for funding public goods as they float around the Web 3.0 community. So historically, public goods are funded by the government. Like that's the classic um, place for public goods to be funded. And of course that fits my two examples with the military and the fireworks display. And of course they can be funded by smaller governments. It doesn't have to be the national government. So that's like the first way of funding public goods. But it's not the only way, and there might be reasons that we might want to create a more democratic way of funding public goods that's outside the purview of the existing government. One such mechanism is crowdfunding. Like here we're talking about Kickstarter types of models where somebody has an idea for something like let's say a documentary or a new video game they want to create. And it's a public good because once they create it, let's say they intend to make the documentary freely available to everyone, nobody has to pay after the fact, but it has to be funded somehow. So one option for funding that would be to crowdfund in a way that is kind of democratic in the sense that it's bringing in votes through the dollars that fund it. But there's other creative mechanisms too. For example, quadratic funding, which is something I've done a video on and I'll link to that below. But basically how it works is it shifts from the $1 one vote mechanism that you have with crowdfunding and it moves it halfway toward one person, one vote. So with one person, one vote, you might not raise a lot of money um, which is why you don't go all the way to one person, one vote. But one dollar, one vote basically says you can buy a vote for a dollar. But if you personally want two votes, that's going to cost you four dollars. That is two squared. And if you want three votes, that's going to cost you nine dollars. So you can have an outsized influence if you have a lot of money, but it's not as big of an outsized influence just because every extra vote you buy is going to cost you more, meaning you're contributing more to the initial cost. Now, you do need some kind of structure to make this work. So for example, you might have a platform that is a quadratic funding platform that says, we're interested in funding investigative journalism. And of course, investigative journalism is definitely a public good because once you've got the information out, you can't exclude people from knowing it and one person knowing it doesn't diminish the value anyone else experiences from knowing that whatever came out of the investigative journalism. So let's say you have a platform and you have like 10 different possible investigative journalistic projects where each one of them has a passionate journalist at the head of it and they're like, I would love to go investigate this, but it's going to require me flying and interviewing people and it's going to require some money. So they each like create a little web page with their vision for what they will investigate and how. And you can donate, except the donations go into this big pool of money that's for all 10 investigative journalists and there's a time limit to donate. So once the time limit's up, you've gotten this huge pool of money. 
and the people in charge of the platform will distribute that money according to the votes where people have purchased votes but it's not exactly one dollar one vote it's the first vote is one dollar if you want two votes you have to pay four dollars for that if you want three votes you pay nine dollars for that etc so the way you distribute the funds will favor the richest people but it's just that their voting weight won't be as heavy as it would be if they were the pure funders now there's other models for funding public goods for example prizes is a classic way like you might have a prize which is five million dollars for whoever comes up with the best treatment for this rare illness that that your mother has or whatnot and the hope there would be that that prize of $5 million will incentivize many people to invest a lot of their money trying to win that prize. And of course you need judges to judge the prize to decide which of these treatments is best. That might even be an expensive process in and of itself. But the, the notion is that you're incentivizing investment in solving this problem. And then retrospective funding is another creative idea for funding public goods. And retrospective funding is fairly similar to prize models for funding public goods, except the difference is with prize models, you have some committee that determines who wins the prize. With retrospective funding, who gets the pool of money after all is said and done is determined by someone's retrospective vote based on how useful something turned out to be. So with this one, you might imagine 15 video game creators who all want to hire their own artists and hire their own programmers to create a really cool idea for a video game. And maybe you have a community of people who would love some new video games and they're willing to sort of contribute to this fund. Or you have just a million dollars to spare for whatever reason. The retrospective funding model would basically say, okay, we're going to set this up such that after the video games have been out for a year, then we're either going to have a vote or else maybe it'll just be by usage, like how many hours did this community use the video games? And the pot of money will be distributed according to how heavily they're used or how they're voted on after the fact. And part of the value of this one is basically that people know the value of something after it exists and after they experience it. Whereas if we just had a crowdfunding model, people can't always tell, will this person be able to execute on their idea? Is the idea as cool as it sounds just with a, with a prototype? All of that kind of stuff. So these are just a few different models that Web 3.0 people are playing around with in terms of how could we do economics differently in an environment where most goods could be public goods.